guess what we're going to be talking about today? Memorial Day. That's right. Um, and specifically, what we're going to be talking about is this article that was in Mother Jones. See, Mother Jones still does some good work. See? See, isn't that nice? Um, <laughs> and it's entitled, We Are Combat Vets and We Want America to Reboot Memorial Day. And uh, so let's get into it. They, they make some great points. This is just as coronavirus has exposed systemic rot. This moment also reveals how obsolete common conceptions of U.S. warfare truly are, raising core questions about the holiday devoted to its sacrifices. The truth is that today's way of war is so abstract, distant and short on at least American casualties as to be nearly invisible to the public. So that's a big part of this. We've talked about it. That's the whole point of an all-voluntary military. So nobody's protesting. And then, you know, you just use neoliberal as economic policies to make people desperate in small towns. Then they, okay, we talked about that. With little to show for it, Washington still directs bloody global campaigns, killing thousands of locals. America has no space on its calendar to memorialize these victims even the children among us, among them. In recent years, U.S. troops were killed not only in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also in Syria, Kenya, Somalia, Yemen, and Niger. Few Americans could locate these countries on a map. Fewer knew its soldiers even fought there. Additionally, Pentagon pilots and proxies killed people in Libya, Pakistan, and elsewhere in West Africa without losing a single soldier. Most people don't even know that we're in. That's when, when, I, when I say, you know, Obama took us from two wars to seven. They're like, what are you talking about? What are the other five? And then I have to tell them. The campaign in Somalia and Yemen best exposed the absurd casualty inequality of modern American warfare. In the former, only a few U.S. service members have been killed in an 18-year intervention. Conversely, hundreds of thousands of Somalis died or were displaced as a direct or indirect result, an exacerbated famine, for example, of a largely U.S. catalyzed war. In Yemen, just one American soldier died in combat, just one, compared to more than 100,000 locals, including 85,000 children that were starved to death in a terror campaign the Saudis couldn't wage without the United States' complicity. So this year, given the stark reality that even a deadly pandemic and pleas for global ceasefire hasn't slowed Washington's war machine, it's reasonable to question the very concept of Memorial Day. Wow, it's a big statement. There are also important parallels with Labor Day, the holiday bookend to today's seasonal kickoff, just as memorializing America's obscenely lopsided battle deaths is increasingly indecent, a federal holiday devoted to a labor movement the government has aggressively eviscerated is troubling. So that's there's a lot more into that article. I recommend everyone go read it. And we have the author with us right here, uh, retired Major Danny Shornson. Uh, he's a veteran of both the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. He's a former history instructor. At West Point, additionally, he's the host of a podcast called Fortress on a Hill and a regular contributor to antiwar.com, L.A. Times, The Nation, and Truth Dig. He's also he has a new book that's coming out, uh, uh, available on Amazon, called Patriotic Descent. Please welcome to the show Danny Shortson. Danny, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Glad to be here. So there's so many things. So just to start off that what that what you were talking about uh what what would you like to see uh us do on memorial day as opposed to what we're doing well you know the first thing i'd like to see is for people to pay attention you know pay attention to what's actually happening you know don't nostalgize and mythologize the casualties at normandy look at what american warfare today is really like and it's different than it was even when i was in iraq and afghanistan question the concept of being there, what's the point, and whether there's something obscene, and, and Matt Ho and I, uh, who jointly wrote this article, we think that there is something obscene about an American way of war that kills into the hundreds of thousands 
and has manufactured a way by design to make sure that very few Americans are killed in the process. Uh, I, I think that I would really like the American people to, you know, take a pause from the memorializing and nostalgizing and actually question the framework of these wars. Let's bring them to a close. If not now, then when in the midst of a pandemic? So they always memorialized the World War II veteran and uh, other people have said that that war has made all the other horrible wars possible because we keep pointing to that war and how we stopped the Nazis and stopped fascism and and the Holocaust and all that stuff. And so that kind of gives cover for the rest of our imperialism. Uh, would you agree with that? Absolutely. You know, World War II was probably, you know, the one war of, you know, the last century and a half that had to be fought. But in some ways, it's been poison to the body politic. You know, there's a book called The Best War Ever. And that's, of course, a sarcastic take on World War II. But the reason it was written is because the legacy of that war is with us. I mean, you know, Jimmy, all the way up to the Iraq war, folks were saying, well, if we appease, you know, if we appease Saddam Hussein, then it'll be like Munich all over again, where we appeased, you know, Hitler. And they did the same thing for Bashar al-Assad and the Taliban. And they're going to do it to the next, you know, the next enemy and the seven or eight enemies we have right now that we're actively bombing and the other 20 enemies we have that we aren't just yet. Uh, This is this is a it's really been a poisonous war. Uh, it's been used to prop up the empire, and that's what I want to say. This is an empire, and and one thing I don't want to be misunderstood about: this is not a Trump empire. And my article and Matt's article is not right. a Trump article. It is a systemic imperial problem. If you want a buffoonish emperor, we've got a Bush for you. If you want a polite emperor, we got an Obama, and if you want a coarse emperor, we got a Trump. But it's the same empire. Yeah, it's that's that that that's exactly right. So. I I have a couple of questions. Uh, well, first of all, I just want people always criticize Trump for being a, a draft dodger. And I was one of those people. And it seems like that's a bad tack to take because uh, someone made the, the, the argument that if John McCain would have beat Barack Obama, he would have had no more moral authority to engage that in the war in Libya or Afghanistan or that then Barack Obama, who never served, they're both doing committing horrible atrocities. So the fact that you served and killed other people in Vietnam doesn't give you moral authority to do it in Yemen or Libya or Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq or anywhere else. Right. So that's so my, yeah. my question is, uh, what do you say to people who criticize Donald Trump because he didn't serve? Well, I mean, I, th- I think it's ridiculous because you can point, you know, that same thing is going to be used against your favorite Democrat someday right. who didn't serve, whether it's a Clinton or an Obama. And let's not make any mistake. Baron Trump is no more likely to join the military or marry a service member than, you know, Sasha and Malia were. So this th- in general, the elites aren't serving any longer. And, and I sort of reject the notion that you, we focus on character you know, rather than policy, which is, of course, the name of the game in the duopoly, as you often point out, right? Focus on what we don't like ad hominem or pejorative about this person. Oh, he was a draft dodger. Well, so were a lot of folks who were, you know, in Congress today uh, and going to be our president in the future. I'm more interested in who's willing to challenge empire. Uh, Nobody's done it so far. Trump said some pretty nice stuff. You know, he hasn't followed through. And when I even mentioned that Trump has said some reasonable stuff, like in his last inaugural when he said, great nations don't fight endless wars. I loathe Trump, but that was correct. Now, he hasn't followed through. But even mentioning that on my behalf gets me vitriol from, you know, the polite left that I otherwise associate with. So, I yeah, I, I, I hear you 100 percent. You have to block those people out because they're very pro-war. <laughs> That's the problem. The Democratic Party, someone tweeted out today, and I retweeted it, the Democratic Party today is indistinguishable from the Republican Party under George Bush. Uh, it, they're, they're, it's Again, it's two war parties. It's really just one war party. Uh, it's the money party, and they really like war. So is it how important do you think it is for ordinary people? To, so just to conclude on Donald Trump, it doesn't matter why someone skipped a war. If you skipped out because you you were dodging it or because you actually had a medical problem, it's no, no. Whenever you can skip out on killing other people for capitalists, that's a good call, right? Absolutely. I'd actually really like to uh, elect 
a pacifist or a Quaker or a draft dodger from the Vietnam War who was proud about that. That that would be great with me. You know, at least that's a principled stand. So, you know, I don't think it makes you a better president because, you know, you drop bombs on folks or and I don't think that I'm any more qualified to speak out just because I have, you know, this veteran platform. No doubt it probably gets me, you know, some publications and attention. But in some sense, that itself is an obscene thing, isn't it? Yes. So oh, you think it's do you think it's important for ordinary citizens to speak out against the war, even though they'll be criticized as being armchair quarterbacks and have their credentials questioned because you've never served? I think it's absolutely vital. Uh, we need to reject the valorization and the canonization of the soldier in the first place. And uh, and fighting against war is actually one of the hardest things to do, speaking out against your war, because, you know, as MLK said, you know, dissent is misunderstood as disloyalty. It is to me. I mean, I've called mm -hmm. a traitor a Russian asset, and, and I'm not alone. You know, Tulsi as well, as you know. Yes. Uh, I think it's vital to speak out on the issues that are hardest to speak out about and reframe patriotism as, in most cases or many cases, dissent. Because the platitude of patriotism hasn't gotten us anywhere, has it? Except, you know, trillions of dollars in debt and 7,000 dead soldiers and probably about 2.2 million foreigners since 9 11. And so now I want to talk about the the conflicts of soldiers who awaken uh, to this problem. Um, so when you were serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, what was your feeling about those wars at the time you were serving? You know, I, I kind of went on my own intellectual and ethical journey. Uh, I evolved, right? <laughs> Not to sound like Obama on gay marriage, but I did. Uh, I was skeptical of the Iraq war while I was there, and I turned against it. Initially, I thought, well, this war's not winnable, and that's why we shouldn't do it. Then I started to think maybe we shouldn't really be here in the first place, you know, in general, uh, across the board. And then only later, especially after Afghanistan and going to grad school and teaching history at West Point, which made me sort of an insurgent, I started to think maybe the entire imperial structure, you know, the system of militarism and the military industrial complex is what we really have to fight. So, I, you know, I evolved, but I'll tell you, maybe I'm ahead of a lot of folks and definitely more radical, if that's the word. But I'm seeing a sea change within the military, within the veterans ranks and, and even in the active duty, many of whom I still speak to, including uh, former students of mine who are lieutenants in Afghanistan now and will text me, you know, opposition to the war that they're currently fighting, you know, privately. Uh, last point on this. I mean, I'm a member of a number of anti-war veteran organizations. And, uh, and, and run a podcast from that perspective. And, you know, right after this show, Fortress on a Hill, we're doing a, a live stream where we're bringing in a slew of anti-war veterans, enlisted officers, West Point grads. And it's almost going to be like our little mini winter soldier hearing from the Vietnam War, you know, explaining our culpability and fighting against the war state. So we're out there, uh, but you won't see us on MSNBC, Jimmy. You know that. Yes, that's very interesting. I'm so glad you brought that up. I almost let that slip right past me. So this is a great article. You, ha I'm sure you've been contacted by Jake Tapper and Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes. They've got to bring you on TV to talk about this, right? Well, you know, it's funny because you mentioned how uh, the Democrats were a lot like the Bush administration in 03. Mm -hmm. uh, just watch Rachel Maddow, right, who I used to have a lot of respect for 10 years ago, uh, wrongfully. Uh, her show now, the guest list, it's it's a Bush alumni party from the Bush administration. It's amazing. It, it, it's it's born again war criminals, you know, mm -hmm. and and they're laundered like dirty money through Las Vegas onto MSNBC. So of course they're not calling me, even though Rachel's first book, Drift, identified these very problems. It was an excellent book, and she's a smart woman, and she obviously has no ethical core. I've, uh, you know, on other radio shows, I've uh, challenged her to a debate on MSNBC. She doesn't care about me, but I would wipe the floor with her Oxford education, I promise you. Uh, yeah, I know you would, uh, because you have the truth on your side. So can you speak to the... So here's the... Here, so there's lots of problems, right? So I had Tulsi on the show, and, you know, she was a strong voiced calling out the intelligence community and our BS foreign wars, which no one else would do. No one else. It is very vital that she did that. Unfortunately, she ended up endorsing the biggest warmonger running, which was such a crusher for me, right? Um, oh. When when you try to challenge people who are currently serving, see, because when, when, when people like, I talk to people who, who are former uh, uh, military, they all say they apologize 
for the to the people of the countries that they invaded and they killed people in or whatever. They uh, but current people like Tulsi couldn't do that. Right. And I said, what do you say to those people? Because it's weird that uh, you can you can be against the wars, which she is. She correctly frames them, which she does. She correctly calls out the intelligence community. Yet she can't tell people not to join anymore. Like there's some kind of a you're kind of betraying your service if you tell because I asked, I go, don't you feel bad that your service might attract other people to go serve in these bogus wars? And so what do you say to that? No, I mean, this is an important problem. Uh, one of the you know, mistakes, although I think it wasn't a mistake at all that I made was, uh, you know, I, I wrote my first book, Ghost Riders of Baghdad, while I was, you know, still in the army. And actually, it came out when I was teaching at West Point. And I was writing these anti-war columns, you know, right on the blurred line of what's legal and what's not within the army. And it got me, you know, investigated in trouble. My pension, you know, uh, you know, was threatened, all this stuff. Really? It's a difficult thing. But I will tell you this, um, you know, it is a difficult thing to ask any, like, former or serving officer to tell people not to join or, you know, to... Uh, disobey orders. But uh, during the Vietnam War, one of the kind of blacked out and whitewashed histories of how that war ended is it wasn't Congress who saved us. And it wasn't, you know, the Kennedy brothers or the, their Democratic Party. And it wasn't even the college kids protesting on campus, although they were an important component. One of the main factors was GI resistance. Folks refused to go on patrol. They had these underground newspapers and coffee shops. Now, part of the reason for that is because they were draftees. And in the volunteer force, that's much harder. However, uh, I think as we saw with the uh, Captain Crozier incident on the aircraft carrier, there are those rumblings I mentioned among, you know, even active duty soldiers and sailors. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of power in that serving and even veteran community because even though it's kind of gross and problematic, folks trust us. Maybe they shouldn't. Maybe yeah. we don't have the moral authority they lend us. But if we have it then I think it becomes an obligation to speak out. And so, uh, you know, I think people have to follow their conscience when it's in the service. I wish I would have had the courage to speak out earlier than 2015, you know, and uh, there's a lot of reasons, you know, none of them very good that I didn't. But uh, for the folks out there listening, I'm not in uniform anymore. I'm not afraid to say it. If your conscience says don't do it, then don't. So doesn't a military person have a, an obligation to the Constitution, right? So that's what they're... And and that if someone gives you an illegal order, you're supposed to disobey it. And was isn't the Iraq war one big illegal order? You know, this is such an important point. I'm glad you brought it up. You know, I, every time I got promoted and when I first got in, I had to take, you know, my oath to uh, follow the you know orders of the president of the United States. But that's secondary. The main part of the oath is support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign mm -hmm. and domestic. Well, I don't remember the last time we constitutionally declared war. It was 1941. And, uh, you know, according to the Nuremberg principles, which we kind of shepherded, uh, the, the number one crime, they said, the number one war crime is the crime of aggression, of, you know, aggressive war. Framed that way, uh, pretty much everything that we are doing currently is illegal and immoral. And so, you know, I question the entire concept that we have some sort of obligation to be company men, because that's what a lot of these folks, these retired generals, these serving generals who go on MSNBC or Fox, it doesn't matter what side of the duopoly they're on. What they are is company men carrying water for the empire. And I'm complicit. I did it for a long time, but it is gross. And it's, and it's destroying what's left of the small R Republic, if there is any. So if people, uh, so, so if there is a war with Iran or China, do you think that the enlisted men should refuse to go? And at one point, should at what point should a soldier refuse? Well, you know, uh, I'll be cautious here, not for my own sake, but because it's it's a difficult thing to tell somebody what they should do. I will say that I like to believe, and although there's not a ton of evidence to support it, I'd like to believe that if we started another war with Iran, which would be grotesquely illegal and unstrategic that I personally would uh, would pack it in. And folks have, you know, there are uh, Camila Meja, you know, was one of the first people to refuse and Lieutenant, uh, there was a Lieutenant up in Washington. I, I do think that the time is coming for a, uh, you know, we'll call it a wildcat sit down strike on the aircraft carriers and in the armored brigades. And people are gonna attack me for saying that. And at this point, I don't really care 
because of the bloodshed that's on all of our hands, because these wars are fought in our names. Civilians like me now, it's fought in our names. Just because there's no draft doesn't mean we're not complicit. We're all in on the system. So here's another difficult question. How do you uh, criticize the senseless and pointlessness of these wars to to the family members and friends of people who've died in these wars and they have to believe that their death meant something. So how do you square that circle? Well, it's, it's, it's something that I personally deal with on the daily. I mean, my, my inbox filled up with more than the usual hate mail today because of this article. And most of it was, you know, sort of reflexive from veterans. Uh, and in some cases, family members of like, Oh my God, are you guys, you and Matt, how are you saying that you're not in favor of honoring the dead? Well, that's, of course, ridiculous. I'm not a monster, at least not mostly. And uh, frankly, my son, who's, you know, maybe 12 feet from me uh, at this moment, is named after three soldiers who died under my command in Iraq, one of whom was, you know, two of whom were totally close friends. There's pictures of them on my wall. We have to be big enough and intellectual enough to hold two opposing concepts in our head at the same time, which is that it is uh, important to honor the folks who died that you loved, you know, that, 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 you know, they were fighting for their brothers, all the platitudes, but they're true. And also understand that the best way to honor them, I think, and I'd like to believe they'd feel is to, you know, create less dead Americans as well as less dead Yemeni children, children whose skins, if they were less brown and religion of their parents, if they were less Muslim would be just, would just horrify Americans, children. And, uh, you know, so I understand that they're – look, I'm close to the family members of some of the soldiers that died under my command, very close. And, and I understand that there is a need for some of them to hold on to the old notion of patriotism, and, and they fear that if they turn against the wars, they're somehow turning against their son. You know, I, I can't tell them how, how to feel, but I think that it is an obligation – for those of us who read and think and, and really give a damn about this country to separate the two and hold the two opposing views in our head at the same time. They ain't all that opposing either. So do, do you find a problem? See, because the tricky part is in consoling them, uh, it, it, it means that believing that some past war was worthy, which then means that a future war is worthy. And as we, as we know now, they aren't. Um, hey, it's, yeah, it's a difficult thing. Uh, I think that, you know, we have to be okay with saying that a consensus of historians agrees, by the way, probably there were only two wars fought in American history that like were worth fighting. And that's the one that freed the slaves indirectly and somewhat directly. And then the one against the Nazis that we eventually got stuck in, but only largely because of the failures of the first war. Uh, right. Yes, it's a difficult thing. It really is. Right, right. And so when you say you want to reboot Memorial Day, how would you like to see Memorial Day rebooted? You know, I think just to simplify it, I'd like to see it used as a jumping off point like we are right now to question and challenge the war state and to provide some empathy for the folks we kill and to recognize that the American way of war has become so outsourced, mercenary and technocratic that mercenaries, militias, and machines are killing people with little cost to us. So, you know, I, I'm not saying we ditch the, the concept of honoring troops. I'm saying maybe we put that on pause for a while until we figure out how to put this republic back together, ditch the empire, and really honor these kids, right, which they largely are, by ending the system that's going to send the next generation to die in some hopeless futile and frankly immoral endeavor. If we can even talk about that, that's a small victory. And in America today, that's about the best we're getting as small victories. Why do you think the news media, even though you know, you and I both know they know better, pushes every war? Why does at Rachel Maddow, even though she wrote a book about it, still a militarist? Why does the New York Times, every war, they're for it on their front page? Why is that an accident? Because there was a there uh, Anon Girardes just wrote a book and he's talking he's going around saying that it isn't a pro there isn't a systemic problem with the news media it's individual journalists who have habits of mind. What do you, what do you say? Uh, you know you're you're an intellectual and an academic plus you have war experience. 
What do you think the reason is that the that the news media ubiquitously gets war wrong and is pro war every time? Well, because like Congress, they're bought, sold, and derelict in their duty. You know, they're all owned by the same people. You know, it's thrown around like a cliche, but there really are only a few people who own these media institutions. And war sells as entertainment and clickbait. That's why they have eagles flying in front of Bradley tanks before we go kill people in Iraq. And uh, and that's where the funding comes from. That's where your bread is buttered. Having me on or Jimmy, you're famous. Even having you on isn't isn't going to help their bottom line. These are contrived talk shows where the very narrow left and right limits, unlike on your show, are laid out beforehand. So what you have is the illusion of an oppositional media, when in reality, the military industrial complex, like Eisenhower originally wanted to do in his speech, really needs to be broadened to say military, industrial, congressional, media complex, because everybody is complicit in the same system. Everybody wins at the top. Everybody scratches everybody's back and retweets everybody and plugs them. But uh, you know who loses? The kids that I know from the housing projects and the rural towns that we threw overboard with the steel industry 40 years ago. Those were the kids that I fell in love with, that I served with. They don't win. And yet we adulate them on the football field as, you know, a, a, a D level participation ribbon and the whole thing is is gross and if i sound a little angry about it it's because i'm letting myself because we all should be and let me, you're de- you're definitely right um, uh, let me ask you quickly about what did what did people in the military think about the intelligence community the democratic party and the news media pushing an evidence-free red baiting conspiracy theory against the president who's the commander-in-chief and was actively ordering people into battle well, you know, uh, the the Democratic Party and uh, the media and Russiagate, in my experience, are very unpopular, highly unpopular, maybe more in the military than even most places. Uh, the military is not a monolith politically like it maybe once was or maybe it never was. It, it's never been just conservative. But, uh, you know, ginning up a new Cold War, that means their blood based on what has demonstrably been, you know, at probably lies, definitely some lies, and, and really just obfuscation across the board and unbacked conjecture, that's not a winner. That is not a winner with the veteran community. Let's remember, Lincoln gets elected, you know, play historian, largely on the uh, ballots of the soldiers who are allowed to come back or mail them in, in like the first that's ever right. mail ballots. And, you know, this is not a winner for Nancy Pelosi. I mean, this is if anyone's more unpopular than Trump uh, with soldiers, I guarantee you it's her. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that's an important point. Look, Russiagate was uh, was a distraction from uh, the reality, which is we should have been critiquing Trump on his active foreign policy and calling on him to live up to some of his relatively earthy and correct campaign promises instead of holding his feet to the fire on empire and whatever else, even domestically. No, no, no. We threw all our chips in for a scam for the Iraq war gate of my generation. Who picked it up, Jimmy? You did. Matt Taibbi did. But uh, how many people in the mainstream media? None. If they found that they don't have jobs anymore. Yeah, none of none of none of the people in the mainstream media. I mean, I guess Matt Taibbi's mainstream. He writes for Rolling Stone, uh, so that would be it. Glenn Green as the Intercept. I mean, everybody else at the Intercept was Russia gating besides Glenn Greenwald, so he he got it right. So that was nice. Hit that the editor of the Intercept still Russia gating till this day at the top of her lungs, hundred hundred miles an hour, still doing that. It's a it's amazing. Um, well, one Russian asset to another, Jimmy. I mean, it, it, I'm going to call my handler after this show, Vlad, and, uh, <laughs> and and tell him what we talked about. But well, the idea- it's amazing. No, that I mean, that's a cudgel. You know, I will just say this before Trump was elected. I got a lot of hate then, too. But it was it was always that I was a traitor and I hated America. But after uh, Trump was elected, then it became, oh, you you know, you love Trump and you're a Russia apologist and a Russian asset. I think that's instructive, actually, because my views didn't change. Yeah, very. That's very. Yeah, of course. Yeah, your views didn't change. But there's there's smear tactics against people telling the truth about war change. That's all. That's the only thing that happened. Uh, 
you know, so we hear about the human cost of war, and do you have anything to say about the, you know, what war does to, so a lot of people say, I'll worry about animals as soon as I can get people to start worrying about people. Mm-hmm. And other people make the argument that if we don't address how we treat animals, which is what the undergirds this whole, our whole culture, uh, not only through animal agriculture, but even the way war treats the environment and the cruelty to animals. Um, from a military testing, I mean, the effects of sanctions, pollutions from our weapons and generations of collateral damage. Can you talk about some of that stuff that's the military uh, man- mindset is inflicted on the earth? Yeah, in in the name of this uh apparently indispensable nation of ours and our, you know, freedom on the tip of a bay and at military that we, you know, adulate and canonize in the name of that, you know, we're the number one polluter, the department of defense, you know, uh, our own soldiers are poisoned by Gulf war syndrome and agent orange. And, and now, you know, batteries being burned in burn pits. I mean, I don't know how many class action suits I've gotten emails, uh, asking me to be a part of it's every generation. It's the same way. And uh, the focus, if at all, is a a two minute clip on the veterans. We do very little to talk about, you know, our influence on the climate and on the environment in a lot of these uh, in a lot of these places. I mean, just one perfect example is that the uh, most of those deaths that you mentioned in my article and me and Matt Ho's article uh, in Yemen and Somalia are actually famine and disease and, and cholera. What folks don't realize is that, as I wrote in a recent article, the number one epidemic exacerbator in history is war. Right. And that was true uh, with the Native Americans. And it's true in Yemen today uh, when you've got desertification in West Africa and East Africa that is already existing from the climate and our contribution to it with the Pentagon. And then you throw uh, drones and refugees and raids on top of that. I mean, it's a petri dish. It's a petri dish before people started talking about that when Americans started dying from Corona. It's always been there. Our sins are manifold and they're interconnected. And that's the structural part. And it's what people don't realize, which is just so crazy that everyone would uh, want to go to war because they thought uh, Assad uh, killed 50 people with a chlorine bomb. Whereas we are literally committing siege warfare on Yemen, which I don't know if you know, that is a war crime. You're not allowed to do that. And that's why 75,000 children died of a famine during a war, because we are blocking medicine, food, any kind of help from getting into those people. And that's called siege warfare. That's illegal. We're doing that. That's the United States. So then we point our finger at Putin and say he's a strong man. He's a thug or Assad's a thug or Gaddafi's a thug. Uh, The biggest thug in the history of humankind is the United States of America. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And it took me a long time to come to that place, longer than it should have. Uh, It's really important what you're saying here. I mean, let's talk about Yemen. I like to be flippant, but hey, at least... The guys we're supporting who are doing it, at least it's a really nice freedom loving regime, the Saudis, right, where they still burn women for witchcraft yeah. and sorcery. It's on the books, folks. Putin is a monster. All right. I'm not, I'm not a fan of Russian foreign policy per se, but it's it's less aggressive than American foreign policy. It's killing less folks directly and indirectly. That doesn't mean I support it. It means I'm willing to hold those same two opposing ideas in my head at the same time. Putin is an imperfect, somewhat problematic leader for the Russians to worry about. But America, using the witch-burning regime that happens to have a lot of oil, is starving children. And we've been doing it for quite some time. And they also backed a guy called Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. I heard that somewhere. And uh, it was our money that helped do it. So blowback 101, empire 101, when are we going to stop it? When When are we going to sit down? When are we? I mean, everybody I talk to. So I travel all over the country. uh, And before the the pandemic, I would travel everywhere, every weekend, going somewhere. And no matter where, to a person, everybody was like, no one ever says more war. Everyone says, let's get out of these wars and put that money into our own country, into infrastructure or education or healthcare or whatever. So 
Uh, and then Trump gets elected on an anti-interventionist platform. They immediately turn him. They give him an extra $131 billion to go bomb people as they say he's in bed with our enemies, which those two things don't make sense. That's how you know they're lying about Russiagate. And they give him an extra $131 billion, and he doesn't complain about it. So there's no way to stop this machine, right? I mean, it's sort of a real revolution, right, Danny? Oh, yeah, some some sort of version of a general strike, which you've advocated, you know, right. uh, when you had Christian Smalls on from from blue collar Staten Island where I grew up. You right. know, we have to apply that to the empire and we have to connect because the media won't do it for us. They ain't going to connect the dots. The dots give them a job. What needs to be connected is the is the opportunity cost of every dollar spent on the aircraft carrier. Right. Every person killed overseas that that blows back on us. I mean, this is domestic and foreign policy are completely connected. Working in the system has never stopped an American war. Never. And, and, and that goes since 1607 when a white dude showed up in Virginia. And if, and if, if we think it's going to work now, it's like thinking that Nancy Pelosi is going to put universal health care in the bailout. It's <laughs> the same delusion. It's the same delusion. It's it's the same sickness with, di you know, different symptoms. It's gross. And, and we got to quit with delusions because, you know, like the Bible says, and I'm not religious, childish things need to be left behind. Americans, not so keen on that so far. And it's only been like 400 years, Jimmy. So, you know, I'm holding out my hope. Would you extend that same philosophy to reform reformation of our political parties? Because I know a lot of people still believe that the answer is somehow... Uh, sucking some more corporate cock, backing the Democratic Party another time, and then trying to get back at him in four years. That's exactly what you said. That's ch childish things, right? Well, it is. And, you know, I haven't even I haven't even like taken a position on, you know, endorsing anybody. I'm not important enough. But I wrote an article called mm -hmm. Gambling on Biden's Foreign Policy about two weeks ago. And I literally got more hate mail all from the left, from the polite liberals, mm -hmm. uh, in one morning that I did in the month before. And that's saying something uh, because I dared mention that Biden is an emperor. You know, he's a little bit less polite than Obama, but he's of the polite emperor mold. He's going to smile like Uncle Joe from Scranton or wherever or, H, mm -hmm. you know, yes. HSBC or whatever. Uh, and. The reality is, if you ex if you gamble on Biden thinking he's going to end the empire, you're in a delusion. You may as well be one of these Mike Pompeo, the raptures coming in Israel types, because it's not going to happen. If you choose to vote for Biden and you know what you're getting, look, you got to do what you got to do. And and I'm I, for me, I'm done. I'm done with the duopoly. Uh, I I think Trump is it is a threat in a number of ways in the climate. But listen, if you think that Biden is going to, you know, dismantle the empire, I mean, I've got oceanfront property in Arizona, as George Strait said. Can you speak for before we let you go? I know you have you got to get to your own show. Uh, you know, troop suicides mirror the slow suicide of all humanity right now. And the military is a big part of that. What are, what are your thoughts on the the high numbers of troop suicides? You know, a lot, a lot of folks said that I didn't pay enough attention honoring troops in my article today. I was like, well, you didn't read the article because I talked about substance abuse and suicide as an epidemic within the military and how maybe if we're going to memorialize anybody, let's focus on them because they're about a thousand times higher than how many soldiers died in Yemen. Uh, on a personal level, both for me and Matt Ho, you know, the Marine and State Department whistleblower who I wrote this with, three soldiers under my command, direct command, took their own lives. All right. Two of those were substance abuse related. Uh, the invisible wound is real and it ain't just a platitude, even though it sounds like one. Uh, but what we like to do is say, what a shame that 22 or 17 or whatever the stat is, veterans are killing themselves today. What a shame. If we thank them more in the airport and pick up a few more checks uh. at TGI Fridays, that'll do it. You know, never saying what is it about readjustment to civilian life from forever war where they're never going to see a victory? What is it about that process that is causing a suicide and a substance abuse epidemic? Uh, it's it, it actually for me, it, it's it's hard, you know, because uh, I people that I love took their own lives. And, and then I'll tell you, you want to talk about substance abuse? Hang out with me after a funeral in Salina, Kansas for a Mexican-American kid who was 
the best soldier ever and then takes his own life. Uh, it, it, it's, it's really problematic. And the folks that are going to be on my live show right after this, doing our kind of winter soldier, give our thoughts on the wars thing, uh, almost every one of them is either personally affected with those, you know, depression and PTSD and substance abuse or know somebody who critically has either taken their life or come close. Uh, that epidemic, that story, if we don't tie it to the empire and to the forever war state, then we're doing a disservice to every one of those people who took their own lives and the future ones because, you know, it'll be 17 more tomorrow. So just hold on. I have no idea how people readjust after being <laughs> in a war zone. I saw a dog get hit by a car. I still have nightmares. I, I have no idea how people can. And I'm not making a joke about that. Like, that's for yep. real. So I have no idea. I'm I'm such a fragile dude in that way. So I can't even imagine how, you know, the stuff that you see and you have to do and I've heard soldiers talk about the stuff they were ordered to do and the things that ripping people out of their houses and making people stand against walls and all kind. you know, just the things they had to do is just, it's, I don't know. I don't know how they do it. So yeah. Um, it, 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 aren't you surprised that the, I mean, like um, there was a town, I think in Utah that decided to make sure that none of their veterans were homeless. Are you, aren't you surprised there isn't like a nationwide program like that? I wish I was surprised. I mean, I do. I, I wish that I was surprised by that. I, I wish that I had enough faith in our systems to think that, you know, our big bear hug of freedom would would, you know, uh, go all the way down to the kids from Western Pennsylvania who serve and die in our military and come back broken uh, physically and emotionally. But I'm not surprised because, you know, the system isn't designed for them. They may be water carriers for that system and we may thank them. But, uh, you know, they're the detritus of empire. And every empire has produced them, and we ain't all that different from them. Uh, it, the, it's, it's gross on so many levels, but I think that it's actually an insult to the military, to veterans, that we purport to adulate and we play all their movies on you know, TBS every Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Yep. Like, frankly, I find these holidays wretched at this point, uh, which is why this year— Matt and I wrote an article saying, let's just ditch it or at least reframe the whole thing. Because frankly, I'm, I'm sick of writing anti-war articles on Memorial Day yeah. uh, because I, I don't have a lot of faith that they're doing any good. But I do hope that like when it comes to, you know, the Occupy style movement and ec economic inequality, that we, you know, take those direct action grassroots messages from history and realize that those are the tactics that work. And I listen to you regularly and I don't think I've seen an episode in a year where you didn't mention the necessity of that. And I appreciate it. And I think a lot of veterans out there do because we're not a monolith and a whole lot of us quietly, mostly, but a whole lot of us are just about fed up. And apathy is the most insulting thing. I, I'd rather be called a baby killer, uh, which isn't completely even wrong, but I'd rather be insulted directly than have, you know, citizen apathy, but that's what reigns. And that's what the media produces that they're all, they're part of the game. What was the word you used? They are the detritus of empire. What was that word? The detritus of empire. What is, yeah. What does that word uh, mean? How do you spell that word? That's a good uh, word. E T R uh, I T U S. Yeah. You know, just like the the trash of empire. You oh, know, okay. the leftovers of empire. And and this this has been the case throughout history. I mean, the British Empire, the same thing. You got these broken imperial soldiers who come home. They don't recognize the country. They just came from who do they not all of them, but who a lot of them take it out on the immigrants to London who came from the same place. They were just trying to pacify. Huh. I mean, this this whole thing works in such a way to divide us, whether it's, you know, by class or ethnicity or immigrant status. But, uh, you know, we're the, we're my generation uh, is just the newest, you know, post Vietnam generation of broken empire of broken soldiers that really are the detritus of, uh, of empire. So, you know, forgive me for not being excited about Joe Biden, you know, who was the number one cheerleader for the Iraq war that broke me. Right. And maybe I'm not a tough enough guy that maybe that's possible. I got a lot of weaknesses. I will tell you that watching teenagers get executed on the side of the road, uh, in, in Iraq because they were Shia or Sunni. And we started that war that broke me. And it changed my life. Now, I'm glad it did. But forgive me for not getting excited about the guy who defended what he called popular President Bush, you know, six months into that war when it was clear we didn't have a single WMD to be found. And, you know, uh, the Civil War had already kind of kicked off. So, yeah, I, I can't get excited for him.
Do you think there is a chance of soldiers refusing to serve at any point? I think it's, if I'm, if I'm a little hopeful, I'm not optimistic. Mm. You know, something to keep in mind. I mean, people talk about the all volunteer force. Uh, it in and of itself, the all volunteer force was designed not by some hippie, uh, you know, uh, SDS activist on a college campus. It was designed by Richard Nixon. It was designed by the Republican party to squelch dissent. That's why it was created. So expecting, you know, the all volunteer force to suddenly, you know, uh, behave like the conscripts of Vietnam it is again, it's, it's sort of another illusion. However, uh, if you push even a volunteer force, which isn't really volunteer, it's an economic draft. I mean, just look at the soldiers I served with. I mean, come on. Right. Uh, but even, even if you push volunteers far enough and you keep them at war for decades, because we're going to go into our third decade of war, not too far from now. Uh, I think you'll see pushback. I think you'll see more folks who uh, passively, aggressively kind of revolt like the sailors did on Captain Crozier's, you know, pandemic ship. Uh, but as for, you know, refusal to serve, less likely. Uh, and so long, final point, so long as the things that you constantly talk about continue, which is economic uh, disparity, unemployment, and the gig economy at the bottom, also part of the same system. So long as that doesn't change, then folks are going to leave their crappy towns and neighborhoods to serve in a place that's the most socialist institution in America, where even if you're 19 and you've got two kids and a teenage wife, because I, I hung out at their houses, the army gives you a house and universal health care and at least a living wage, mostly. So, you know, I mean, my point is, if you think that on the demand end, you know, less folks are going to join, even that's unlikely so long as we maintain the oligarchy. And again, it's not conspiratorial to say that it's part of the same system because Nixon designed it. Nixon, not George McGovern, not John F. Kennedy. Danny Shortson, thanks so much. Uh, retired major Danny Shortson, anti-war activist, uh, host of the Fortress on a Hill, which is doing a live stream starting right now. Is that on a YouTube live stream? Uh, yeah, we're on uh, yeah Facebook, Facebook? Uh, Fortress okay. on a Hill. Check us out, and uh, yeah, you know if you don't mind, if you if if you want to check out my columns, uh, I'm a contributing editor at AnnieWar.com, and uh, my website is SkepticalVet.com. So I'm all over the place, even Mother Jones, uh, which is for only the second time. But thanks so much for having me, Jimmy, and having this honest conversation that I couldn't have had anywhere else. Number one, because they wouldn't have invited me, and number two, because very few people are asking these questions. Well, I really appreciate your work and your advocacy and your truth telling and your courage to do so. And uh, it really makes a big difference. So thanks again. And we look forward to talking to you. Hey, let me know when your book is out. It's called Patriotic Descent. And we'll have you back on. OK. Thanks, Jimmy. Glad to do it anytime. OK, buddy. Hey, this is the part where I tell you where our live shows are, but there aren't any. <laughs> and then I would tell you to go join our premium. But, but nobody has a fucking job. So why don't you just enjoy the video?